Newberry. Uh, I'll be your host and moderator for the Lunch and Learn today. Uh, with me is uh, one of our senior team members, Todd Chadoba, as well as Solutions Engineer George Rodriguez. Todd and George will be joining us in just a few moments, but uh, real quick first, I want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items uh, before we get started. So number one, if you are in a pizza delivery zone and you requested a pizza during your registration, uh, that pizza should be arriving in the next few minutes if it hasn't already. Uh, sometimes the delivery person does run a few minutes behind. Um, if they are running late, just please be patient, but be sure to let us know if your pizza has not arrived by 1.10 or 1.15 Eastern time or so. Uh, email is the quickest way to let us know if your pizza has not arrived. Uh, my email is tylern at ami.com, and that is also listed in your chat screen on the presentation should you need to reach me. And once again, for our folks on the West Coast, uh, your pizza will be arriving at 11 a.m. local time since that's the earliest that your restaurants open out there. Uh, number two, please ask us questions during the presentation. We want to provide as, as much of an interactive experience for all of you as we can, so feel free to shoot your questions over on the Q&A communicator located at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and we'll answer your question either live on air or we'll send you a message back via the Q&A communicator. And finally, if we experience any technical difficulties, such as losing audio or if the screen becomes grainy for a moment, um, just please bear with us. Usually these issues will work themselves out, but occasionally um, we can fix the issue um, in just a moment or so. Uh, these technical issues are rare, but they can certainly still happen, so just please be patient with us if that happens. Um, but other than that, that's all I've got. Uh, I will go ahead and turn it over to Todd for part one of the presentation today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, Tyler, thanks for the, uh, the introduction there. Um, I am Todd Chidobo. I'm uh, one of the, uh, the, the sales executives for the channel division here at Store Trends. Uh, I'll be guiding, uh, guiding you through the, uh, the presentation, talking about uh, you know, really what's out there in the storage market right now when it comes to all flash, hybrid, and, uh, and spinning disk arrays. Uh, a little bit about uh, the, the store trend offerings and, and kind of the overview of how they all operate and where they really kind of fit into the, uh, into, uh, you know, the market today. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into – oh, I already did that. Uh, okay, here we go. So anyways, yeah, I've been with AMI for, uh, for uh, quite a number of years now. Um, Actually, June will be my 25th year. I've worn a number of hats here at uh, at AMI, uh, but I've been in the storage market, uh, the storage team here for about the last seven or eight years. Um, I'm also joined today with uh, by store uh, by uh, George Rodriguez. He's one of our uh, sales and solutions engineers. He's been with AMI for quite a while. He's uh, he's got experience with a lot of the different uh, products that we've got. <clears throat> excuse me, in at American Megatrends, but he'll be able to to guide us through. Uh, a demo of uh, store trends, and of course, if we've got some technical questions that come in, he'll be able to assist us through those as well. <clears throat> so quickly, just what we're going to go through today, uh, going to go talk a little bit about who AMI is, uh, where store trends got, our, where we got our start in store trends. Uh, obviously, we want to understand the landscape of the storage industry that's out there right now. Talk a little bit about how the architectures of the different all-flash and hybrid and spinning uh, 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 arrays uh, are out there, as well as uh, kind of do a comparison from a pricing perspective and whatnot. Uh, we'll jump into a little bit about uh, what the feature sets are and what the different technologies are that we bring to the table. And then, of course, we'll turn the ball over to, uh, to George to walk us through a live demo of the actual Store Trends product. So um, Store Trends is the data storage division from American Megatrends. Um, uh, many of us might know of, of who American Megatrends is, but we'll dive into a little bit more of that here in the next, uh, in the next couple slides. Uh, we are a, uh, an international company. We are, we've been uh, in existence since 1985, so we're 30, 30 plus years in, uh, in, in business. Obviously, we've got a worldwide presence. We have currently are pushing 1,500 employees worldwide, and about 80% of, uh, of our employees do work at an engineering capacity. So we are very much engineering focused um, and, and whatnot. So, uh, as we go through the next couple slides, we'll talk about some of the different product divisions that are within AMI. Uh, within these different product divisions, we actually have a presence in probably about half the computers in the world that ship today. So um, that's, that is uh, quite an impressive uh, portfolio that we've got. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, as we go forward. 
Uh, Company-wide, we've got about 300, 375 plus patents on some of the different IP that we have. Uh, over 125 of those are granted just in the storage division itself. Uh, obviously, if we're shipping in over half the computers in the world today, we currently, you know, obviously we're getting into the billions of products that have shipped. Uh, we are ISO 9001 uh, uh, compliant, um, and our, our mission statement is providing our customers with the highest quality products, the first time, every time. So a lot of times when uh, I'm doing trade shows and whatnot, you know, I'm, I'm talking about store trends or, or some of our other products, and a lot of people are looking at the uh, the logo that's on the banner behind me, and they'll see the light the light bulb will kind of go off when they see the uh, the logo that we've got. So if you recognize the logo, uh, you you know you're you're certainly not alone. We have uh, this is something that we all remember seeing when you would see the your memory post up when you booted your old your old systems. So this, that is us, uh, uh, so we've been around obviously since 1985. The BIOS that, we, uh, that we're talking about here is, is clearly uh, still one of the, the mainstays of American Megatrends. Um, so again, we've been a world leader in that for pushing, uh, for pushing 30 years now, and of course that, hasn't, that, you know, that still continues today. Uh, obviously our BIOS is gonna have a presence in you know, servers, storage arrays, desktops, embedded systems, go on down the list. Obviously uh, you're gonna see a presence with Web AMI inside of pretty much all the BIOS stuff that's out there. Another area that we're kind of under the hood, and that's kind of what what you're going to find as a as a common denominator with a lot of our products, is that we're kind of we're an OEM provider of a lot of different types of products. Uh, remote management is certainly uh, is certainly no exception here. We've been a market leader with uh, you know our MegaRack IPMI or remote KVM uh, uh, products for uh, you know for about uh, 20 years now. So. Um, if you recognize some of the other IPMI types of uh, products that are out there from some of the big guys that are there, we actually provide the the, uh, the, the under the, the hood uh, components to allow their uh, their remote access controllers to actually operate. So, uh, so that that's our Mega Act division, and again, that's one of our our, our big leaders. Um, if you go back a number of years, um, back in the mid 90s, we were actually the creator of the Mega Raid RAID controller card. Uh, this was the number one RAID controller card in the world at the time, recognized by Gartner. Um, and obviously, that was a, a huge seller for us. Uh, back in 2001, um, we did sell this product division off to, uh, to LSI Logic, and I believe is now known as Avago Tech. Uh, but basically, obviously, when when you sell a product division off like that, you kind of get out of have to get out of that uh, that that realm. So we had to uh, you know exit out of the storage game for a number of years. But basically, after the uh, the the sell off of the of the division, we brought the team back together and we started writing the code for Store Trends. So Store Trends has actually been in existence since around 2004-2005 is when we began writing code for this. We were doing a lot of primarily OEM work with the, with the product in the early days. Uh, after a lot of the, uh, the, the sell-off of, or the product, or the acquisitions, I should say, across the, uh, the storage industry, uh, we decided that uh, it was best for us to go ahead and move to the channel. And we've been in the channel for a number of years. And this is our current product uh, lineup right now that we're that we're looking at here, and a little bit of the evolution as to uh, how we've gotten to where we are today. So, a number of years back, we we came out with the 3400 dual controller uh, SAN. This is a 3U 16 bay unit that's uh, that's uh, basically an all spinning array. But this is where we brought in tiering into the into the into the scope of the discussion. Um, and that's important because that'll carry through the uh, the other brands or the other products that we have as well. Uh, fast forward a couple years later, SSDs are becoming more much more affordable, but not quite as affordable. And obviously, the capacity crunch in the SSDs were still uh, certainly there. Uh, but this is where the hybrids became started becoming much more popular. And of course, we we introduced our our 3500 at that time as well. And then, uh, obviously, today we're more talking about the all-flash arrays. Now that the the, uh, the cost of SSDs have come down, we've got some feature te or some technology that, of course, helps us get the most capacity out of those guys as well. And of course, we'll get into you know some of the nuts and bolts as to how those actually operate as we move forward. 
that being said, obviously we are a uh, you know a SAN provider. A lot of people want to you know ask, well, where do we really play? What verticals do we really play in? It's uh, you know of course it's kind of a loaded question because of course you know when you're talking about SAN and NAS, you're talking about you know data, and obviously every every you know vertical is going to have data that they've got to manage. So you know we certainly target verticals that include education, finance. Healthcare, manufacturing, you know, going down the list, legal, retail, and of course we've got a presence in each one of these types of verticals and, and obviously many more that we may not even have listed here as well. Uh, we do have thousands of installs worldwide. Uh, we do have a pretty big focus on the SMB and SME market. Uh, this is really just a cross section of some of the uh, some of our current uh, um, um, uh, customers that we've got deployments into right now. Obviously, I'm not going to go through these, but of course, they they do represent uh, pretty much all of our different verticals that we've got out there. So moving forward, you know, of course, why are why is everybody here? So there's a, a number of challenges that most of us face in our environments. Um, a lot of folks, uh, a lot of folks face uh, a lot of latencies, especially if you've got some of the, you know, spinning disk types of arrays out there. There's a lot of uh, latencies that 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 come into play, and of course that wreaks havoc in your uh, in in your virtualized environments and whatnot. So uh, latencies are becoming much more a part of the discussion. Um, some new product projects that are coming up, uh, you know, VDI projects are certainly something that. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are, are talking about if they haven't already begun to try and implement it, that's a part of something that they're interested in or looking into. Uh, just a quick plug, we do have another product in our channel, uh, in our channel product lineup that we're not going to talk about in this, in this uh, presentation, but, you know, if you've got inf or, uh, some questions about it and you're looking into VDI, we basically have a VDI in, the bo in a box an all-in-one, one throat to choke, end-to-end -end type of VDI solution. So, um, while of course storage, you know, standard storage is is, ver is good with VDI, there's obviously other options as well. So, if you've got some VDI projects, certainly don't hesitate to let us know. We'd love to discuss those with you. Uh, some other reasons people, uh, you know, you want to attend, a, you know, a seminar like this is, you know, you're doing a storage upgrade. You got some older storage, and things are just getting a little bit long in the tooth, and it's time to start upgrading. So you're wanting to see what's out there. Uh, you know, the data, you know, data growth. Obviously, everybody deals with capacity, uh, the capacity growth, and of course, what what happens when your older sand starts running out of uh, running out of space? What are you looking into? Uh, sometimes you have a new big business acquisition or you've got a new a whole new division that you're building out or a new project that you're wanting to plan for that obviously uh, drives a lot of attendance to our uh, to our um, uh, you know events like this uh, uh, learning and planning obviously everybody likes to understand what's out there in the industry right now what's happening and 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 what's coming up when I do have a project coming up down down the road I, I already know kind of what's out there uh, this last bullet is one I like to put in there. Uh, we do we do uh, these events, you know, like this in a, in a virtual sense, uh, but also we do some of these in a live event as well. Um, I was doing one of these uh, a, a live lunch and learn about a year ago, and as I was shaking people's hands and they were leaving the restaurant and whatnot, you know, I usually ask, you know, what kind of projects are you working on? What can I help you out with? And the guy looked at me and he he basically said, you know, hey, I appreciate uh, your presentation, this, that, and the other. But at the end of the day, I really just am here to get the free steak that you guys are offering. So, of course, if uh, if you guys are, are are looking for some some food and you know maybe that's something that uh, you're interested in down the road, that's fine too. Enjoy the pizza, but I hope you keep us in mind when we do get into uh, planning for some of your uh, future needs. All right, let's take a look at pretty much what our product offering is and kind of talk about what uh, what. You know how these are are, are are approached from different from different vendors as well as us as well. So our 3400 that's been uh, we've had the 3500 or 30 I'm sorry the 3400 in existence for a number of years now. This is our all spinning array. Uh, basically, what this does this consists of is a head unit is going to be a 3U 16 bay unit. Uh, you're going to have uh, uh, like disks throughout that uh, throughout that shelf. Whether they be 7,200 RPM drives or 15,000 RPM drives, you know, SAS or SATA, you know, of course we do support different RAID types and whatnot, and of course we can expand this out with, uh, you know, either the same RAID, uh, the same drive type and RAID sets to 
really just strike the amount of, uh, of, of I.O. load across the two, or we can start getting into a tiered approach where you might have that head unit full of, you know, 15,000 RPM drives that are configured in a RAID 10, and then you would have an expansion shelf that's going to be consistent of, uh, you know, 7,200 RPM drives, maybe in a RAID 5 to give you a little bit more uh, 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 capacity. What we're able to do is, uh, is manage volumes and give them some priorities and whatnot. So basically all of your, your, your most accessed blocks are going to be managed or handled in that hot tier or that higher performing tier. And then, of course, as blocks get less access or, uh, or more stale, we're going to automatically demote those down to that, uh, that spinning tier. So that way we're going to keep all of your uh, most important data, your most highly accessed data, most available for you and provide the most performance in that regard. Moving forward to the, the hybrid approach, uh, most of the vendors that are out there, they usually give you one of a couple of options. They're either going to give you caching as, a, uh, as an SSD performance layer or they're going to give you tiering. Um, with our architecture, we're actually providing both a caching and a tiering met, uh, approach to the hybrid. But obviously, the hybrid as, in general is just going to be in, the inclusion of SSDs as well as HDDs in a single solution. So this, again, is a dual controllers, 3U, 16-bay chassis. We're going to have a handful of disks, usually four or six disks that are going to be a, a performance tier. We'll generally have, and then we'll add two additional disks that are going to be there for uh, for our caching layer, and then the remaining disks on the back end would be uh, would be uh, NL SAS disks for so for uh, uh, for more of your capacity and lower performance needs. Much like the the upper uh, the the 3400 offering, you know, we do have a tiering approach here. So basically, what we're do what we're doing is we've provided, uh, you know, we've got. Uh, uh, automatically tuned volumes basically is how we're going to operate this guy. So if you've got uh, high performance volumes, we're going to we're going to give high performance policies to those volumes. Uh, all of the most access blocks or the most uh, recent blocks that you're utilizing are going to be serviced through that uh, through that tier, through that SSD tier, and give you the most performance. Of course, as the blocks get older and less accessed, we'll go ahead and demote those down to the spinning layer. And then, of course, what we're doing for the, uh, for the caching is if you then go and do some rewrites on those older blocks that have already been demoted, the first service will come out of the, or out of the spinning drives, but then from there we're going to mark those into our cache. And then any, any rewrites that are occurring are going to happen in that, in that caching layer, so that way we're going to be able to service even you know, access blocks to the, that are in the cold tier from, uh, from SSDs that is going to give you the highest performance possible. We do have volume pinning here, so you could also, uh, while you're obviously trying to keep uh, your high performance needs in your high performance layers, we can also make sure that we're leaving as much of that space available to you by taking your lower performance stuff and only allowing it to touch the spinning drive. So um, obviously when you're talking about a, a hybrid solution, you know, you're always going to be balancing the amount of capacity that you're using in your SSD space versus your, your, spinning, your spinning space. Uh, with that in mind, we fast forward to the, uh, to the all flash offering. And of course, this is going to provide, you know, performance all the way across the board. We do still have a tiered approach to this. I'm going to dive into, some, uh, into the architecture of the all flash offering you know, as we move forward. But as you see, we pretty much have, you know, all of the different uh, uh, models that are available to us in our, in our, uh, uh, our, our lineup here. Uh, this is just a quick cross-section cross again. 3400 is our all-spinning uh, uh, 3U 16-bay unit. 3500 is the, six, is the same unit. Dual, of course, these are all dual controller. All of the components are going to be redundant and hot swappable. Uh, the 3610 was our first foray into, uh, into all-flash. That was our, our 3U 16-bay unit as well. Uh, the latest offering we've got is the 2610. Uh, we can talk about the differences in those two as we move forward as well. The 2610, uh, this is a 2U 24-bay uh, system, so we did change the, the, uh, the hardware for, the, for that 2610. Um, 
This is a little bit of an eye chart, so I'm not going to read all of this to you, but obviously if anybody is re, uh, would like to have the uh, this presentation, by the way, when this is all said and done, uh, let uh, Tyler know, and of course we'll get that out to you. So we've got all these different uh, all these different approaches to uh, storage. Which one's going to make the most sense for you? And of course, a lot of this is going to be very dependent upon your uh, your needs. So what we're looking at here is a, is a latency chart. Uh, I'll first say, uh, you know, when we're talking about spinning drives and whatnot, you know, IOPS was typically the way that everybody was measuring their performance. Well, nowadays, when you get into SSDs and you're talking about the ability for an SSD to provide, you know, 20, 30, 50,000 IOPS, it's not necessarily about the amount of IOPS that these disks are able to provide. More of, the, more of the measure of performance these days is really going to be more of a latency. And obviously that's the, you know, the time that it takes to service an I.O. Um, so what we've got here is a comparison between the three models that we've gotten within our product family. So I'm not comparing myself and saying so, you know, some other solution is garbage. This is just really comparing the approach of spinning to, uh, to hybrid to an off-flash. So, what we've got is the, the, the top uh, line, that red line. This is going to be our 3400 all spinning array. And what you're looking at here is, is, is really basically high latency that's going to be provided from the, those spinning drives. In a lot of environments, that's okay. You don't have a huge demand on, on, on your latency, and it's no big deal. And, and obviously, a lot of us have survived for a long time utilizing spinning drives as well. But you can see when you're doing a comparison of latency, you can see that the spinning drives really don't do a, a, a lot for latencies. Moving down to the next line, the light green line, this is going to be our, our 3500 off uh, um, hybrid array. You can see that the latencies are really coming down considerably. Um, you know, what you're looking at in the beginning of the chart is you're seeing, you know, the, the data going into, the, uh, into the, the performance layer. Then, of course, it's flushing down. Then we're filling back up. That, that's going to happen when you first get into the, uh, the hybrid array. As you get down towards the end of the line, you can see as we start normalizing and we start understanding where our hot blocks are and whatnot, we're going to be able to service these blocks a lot more efficiently. And you can see that the, uh, the, I, the, the latency spikes really lessen out, lessen and flatten out. But we're still only getting you know, somewhere around that, uh, that three to five uh, millisecond range from, a, uh, from, uh, from the uh, hybrid solution. The bottom line is our all-flash array. Uh, the big thing to note here is the, uh, how steady the, uh, the I.O. is being serviced here. And, of course, the, uh, the, the, the fact that the I.O. is really down to, uh, you know, around the one millisecond or somewhat sub, sub one millisecond uh, latency number here. So, again, just kind of a differentiator between the different products and the different approaches to storage. Uh, of course, understanding what you know, what you know, the cost of each of these different units are is extremely important. Uh, we are definitely uh, we, we 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 like to get people's input and, and talk to them immediately. Cost is obviously a huge driver for what's going to how what I can actually put in in place in my environment. Uh, if you go to the Store Trends website, we do have a form there called the price, the price quote generator. is a great tool to. You know, give us a little bit of information, you know, obviously what kind of capacity you're looking for, what are the applications you're running at, um, and whatnot. And that, that gives us a good idea to give you at least a, a, a beginning discussion of where we can start thinking about where our budget numbers are going to be. Uh, we're not going to pound you, you know, with, with sales calls and whatnot. This is a pretty simple pro prospect. Put in some information. We'll send you out a quote. Um, and then obviously answer any other questions that you guys might have. So I want to move forward and get into a little bit of the technology aspects of uh, specifically the 2610. Um, before I get into the, the overview and, and, and the 30,000 foot you know, view of how the I.O. traverses the 2610, I really want to point out just really the, the different feature sets that we bring. Um, 
I don't want to read every single bullet point here, but the, the concept of this is that this isn't just a box full of SSDs that we're providing to you and just, you know, saying that, you know, performance, performance, performance. Obviously, when you're talking about a SAN array, you've got to make sure that you've got all the, uh, all of the different components that's going to, you know, complete your, your, your array. So, you know, when you start talking about the feature sets, we've, we do bring dedupe and compression. That's going to be a big part of our discussion moving forward. But we've also got everything, the, you know, the stuff that you would expect to see in a, a, in a, uh, a high-level SAN, such as advanced snapshots. Uh, replication, we've got a lot, of, a lot of features that are built around a replication. Uh, that was really one of our mainstays before we started getting into more of the performance side. Uh, but anyways, uh, replication is a huge piece of that. Um, our RAID technology and how we're able to manage the block, uh, the block I.O. is a huge feature set that we bring. Um, you know, one of the big things that we do as well that's different from a lot of the different vendors that we have out there is we've got, a, we've got hundreds of configurations that we can actually choose from. So we don't, have, we don't offer, you know, three different versions and say pick one of them. We're actually going to be able to tailor a, a configuration to meet, you know, your specific needs. Um, an important thing to mention at this point is really the fact that this is, uh, we are a, a, no individual licenses. This is an all-inclusive price point, so when you do see a price from us, it's going to include, you know, all the feature sets that we've got. Uh, we don't like to confuse the discussion by saying, uh, I'm sorry, confuse the discussion by, by, you know, having different price points for different, uh, for different licenses. So we're not going to hit you with, you know, here's a price, but oh wait, you didn't tell me that you wanted snapshots turned on. You know, that's going to be an additional license fee. We don't play that game. Everything is going to come out of the box, ready to go. Um, obviously, we're compliant with all the big players that are in the uh, that are in the industry. When you're talking about Microsoft and VMware and all those guys, of course, we've got the VAI support for everything. You know, from a, from a performance perspective, we're going to get a uh, you know uh, uh, awesome uh, uh, performance with latency as well as I/O. Um, when you see some of the uh, the pricing that you come from us, we're going to see that uh, you know we come at a very aggressive price point, especially compared to the different players that are in the industry today. <clears throat> The 2610, is, uh, all of these really are going to lend themselves well to, you know, obviously high performance databases are going to mix, are going to play well with all flash, mixed workloads, VDI, virtual environments, those also play well with all flash as well as some of the hybrid as well as uh, spinning disks offering that we've got as well. So dedupe and compression, this is going to be, you know, a big impact when it comes to the value that the 2610 brings. Um, so obviously when we're talking about, you know, going to an all-flash, one of the big, con big concerns is that, you know, the, the size of the drives haven't quite advanced as fast as, you know, what we're used to seeing from a spinning drive uh, uh, perspective. <clears throat> Generally speaking, what we see from our uh, from our compact ratios or compaction ratios, I should say, is about a four to one on average. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys are scratching your heads and going, "Yeah, right, four to one." And of course, it's 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 true. There's you know the amount of of compaction that you get is going to be dependent upon your workload and your data sets. Of course, obviously, you know. Uh, uh, virtualized environments, VDI environments, obviously are going to be, you know, extremely good. Um, you know, a lot of databases uh, compact pretty well as well. You know, and then of course there's a lot of user data that may not compact as well. But <clears throat> on average, we see about a three or four to one compaction ratio. But one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about when you're talking about um, combining both. Um, uh, uh, dedupe and compression as well as all flash is there is a is there is a big uh, hit when it comes to uh, performance when it comes to bringing in that dedupe and compression obviously there's a lot of there's a lot going on under the hood when you're talking about analyzing every block and figuring out you know what uh, you know if they've already been written and this that and the other so there's no matter what anybody tells you, there is a huge hit when it comes to providing uh, dedupe and compression so what we've done. We've actually gone back to our tiering methodology, and we've brought in basically a hot tier and a cold tier. And we've, again, we've implemented the the, the uh, caches in between those two layers as well. So, the 24 bay unit that we've got, we're going to dedicate eight drive, eight SSD drives to your hot tier. 
on this hot tier, we're not going to have any dedupe, we're not going to have any compression. This is just going to be the raw drives that are there in their own RAID set, and they're going to be able to supply or, or, or uh, uh, provide all of the performance that's coming in for your, all of your hot and active data. Um, and similar to the, to the hybrid array, when those blocks get less accessed and whatnot, we can automatically demote those blocks down to the, what we call the cold tier. This is where it's going to go through our dedupe and compression engines, and this is where we're going to really get into being able to get the most out of the capacity that we've got from those SSD drives. Again, back to the scenario of, well, what happens if I go and, and uh, access those old blocks, what's going to happen? Well, again, we're going to service them initially from that cold tier uh, that would go through our dedupe and compression engine. This is going to have a little bit of a, a performance overhead when you're talking about comparing it to what we're getting out of the hot tier. But at the end of the day, this is still all flash, and you're still going to see you know, incredible performance you know, over, over what you would normally see out of spinning drives. Anyways, when we do access those blocks, again, like we were doing in the hybrid array, we're going to actually, uh, those rewrites are going to occur on a caching layer. So that way we're going to keep, you know, that data from bouncing back and forth between the hot tiers and adding additional re, uh, uh, writes when they don't necessarily need to occur. So basically what we're going to do when we service those in the, in the cache, we're going to make sure that the, uh, the blocks are, going, are, are, are at rest. So basically if we continue to write, we know that these are hot blocks and we'll, we will go ahead and promote that up to the hot tier. If they continue to get cold, you know, not accessed, and they were really only accessed a handful of times, we'll go ahead and commit those changes down to the cold tier. And I got a little ahead of myself. That I pretty much just explained this entire uh, <laughs> this entire uh, slide that, in that last one. Uh, but again, this is kind of shows you where the blocks are going and when uh, when this all occurs. So that caching layer, we've actually got that patented, and it's called our in-lift cache. So. Um, that is that. So, of course, the you know we touched on this a, a couple slides ago as well. You know, what's the uh, you know what's the best solution for me? Um, really, at the end of the day, uh, you know, hybrid does provide a you know a, a really good value. It provides a lot of of, of good performance. Um, you know, and it's going to fit extremely well in a lot of environments where you don't get a good compaction ratio. So really, when it comes down to it, we need to analyze what, kind, what type of data that you've got. If you've got VDI, you've got a lot of, uh, uh, you know, virtual environment, a lot of, a lot of that. You know, we're going to really think that, or we're going to go towards the, uh, the all-flash where we're going to get a lot of, lot of capacity out of the, uh, the dedupe and compression that we've got. You know, you've got a lot of user data or you've got a lot of data that's really not high performance needs, but you have a, a small amount of, you know, you've got a handful of databases that you really need to serve a high amount of performance to, you know, the hybrid might be a better solution for you. The good thing is, is that we've got a lot of tools that help us analyze what it is that you guys have going on. Uh, we've got a tool it's on our website. It's free to it's free to download. It's free to run. It's free to get the uh, the uh, the report back, and it's called iData. What this is is an environment analysis tool. It would run if you're in a virtualized environment. You could basically point it to your 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 hosts. It would automatically pick up all of the VMs. If you had additional physical servers, you can add those into the test run as well. It's going to run natively for seven days. This way we can pick up, uh, you know, your weekly activities, including, you know, any kind of backup windows or anything that you guys might have going on over the weekends. But anyways, it'll give us a good cross-section as to what's going on in your, in your environment. Um, at the end of the run, we'll be able to we'll get the file back from you. We'll generate a report. This is going to give us a really good idea as uh, you know, first off, from just an overview of everything that you're putting on the run, it's going to give us capacity usage. We're going to see your I.O. loads. A big part of the I.O. load that we'll be analyzing is your read versus write. You know, obviously we've got a lot of industry standards that, you know, most folks are going to follow when they come to scoping out your environment. Well, read versus write is one of those things that not a lot, not a lot of people can give you a good answer as to what they're truly running. So a tool like this gives us a really good indicator as to what your environment really is going to need. Um, other scenarios we're following, of course, are going to be network utilization and bandwidth. Uh, we're going to be able to identify what your hot and active data is versus your cold data. This helps us size out what we really need to make sure we're providing for, either from an uh, all-flash or from a uh, 
uh, a hybrid solution when it comes to making sure we've got enough space there in that hot tier. Um, so overall performance, uh, system performance, we'll also go through and break down from a, 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 you know, a server by server so we can see or pinpoint if we've got some particular uh, you know, pain points or, or some particular uh, servers that are really hitting hard, we'll be able to identify those. And of course, we'll be able to plan for those uh, uh, you know, for your uh, environment. Uh, one of the last thing that I really want to touch on here is the is support. Uh, you know, we've been around for 30 plus years, and obviously we've covered a number of different uh, you know product lines. But one of the things that we've absolutely learned in our time, you know, uh, in the industry is is without a without a lot of good support, you know, you really don't have a good product. So. Um, you know, certainly we, while we design a, 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 an outstanding product, you know, there, that doesn't mean that we don't run into some issues from time to time. And, you know, really it's not, you know, if you have a problem, it's how you actually handle it. And that's obviously a place where we stand out. Uh, if you, you know, talk to any of our reference customers, you'll certainly, you know, that'll be one of the things that they'll, they'll you know, you'll, you'll probably hear uh, most often is the amount of and detail of the uh, support that we provide. Uh, we do have 24 by 7 phone uh, support from Store Trends engineers. When the phone rings here, you are calling our our our, um, our headquarters here in Atlanta, Georgia. So you might have a little bit of a southern accent, but as for, other than that, we shouldn't run into too many uh, uh, you know too many communication problems when it comes to that. You're not going to be bounced around from phone queue to phone queue trying to get somebody on the phone. You're actually going to have one of our qualified Store Trends engineers picking up the phone. Um, we do provide uh, four hour as well as next business day on site support. Uh, as far as our, our firmware updates go, again, all of our systems are, are uh, dual controller, all of the stuff is, is, is redundant and whatnot. So basically when we're doing firmware updates, <clears throat> excuse me, we, uh, we, we are able to conduct these in a uh, now, no downtime scenario. Obviously, we're going to, you know, suggest that we do this in some sort of a maintenance window, but, you know, we can certainly do this without bringing down your environment. Uh, one of the things that comes with, uh, with our store aid support is proactive health monitoring. And basically what that means is we are able to, uh, we, we make our, our uh, support team available to be a recipient of some of your more critical alerts that come from the store trends unit. So, so basically what that means is, you know, on Saturday night when you're watching the game, you do still have another set of uh, eyes on your, on your environment. And, you know, if we see something going on, we're going to be notified. We're going to start reacting to it. Uh, you know, whatever, a drive fails over the weekend, oftentimes we'll start that R RMA process before even a, uh, you know, before the customer even realizes that there was an issue. <clears throat> Um, so that's that's a big thing that comes you know, with our store aid. That's not an additional uh, fee that comes with our standard store aid support. Um, we do guarantee our SSDs. Uh, obviously, the endurance of those is where we're most concerned about the wear and tear of them. And obviously, you know, compared to a spinning drive, you know, they're much more easy to follow because the endurance is really what the, the, the main key factor is that where you see, you know, failures occur. So we do guarantee the endurance of these things to last at least five years. Of course, we're, uh, you know, within that five years when you're under support, when you're under one of our support contracts, you know, we'll, we'll replace any drive failures, of course, within, uh, you know, when you're under contract with us at no additional cost to you. Uh, we do support terms uh, from one to five years. We can extend even beyond that uh, if need be. Um, one of the big things I like to point out as well, uh, something that we do that's a little bit different than what uh, some of the industry out there does, we actually assign accounts to different, uh, to different support uh, teams. So that way when you call in, it's not going to be, you know, a complete stranger that you've got to explain your entire environment to. You're going to have someone answering the phone that's, that's familiar with your setup, who's, who's, who you may or may not have talked to before, but they're going to be abreast as to what's going on. So you're not going to have to go through, you know, that, that drill the cable company makes you do where it's like you call in and they're going to tell you to, did you unplug your, you know, your box and wait 30 seconds. We're not going to play that game. You're going to have someone on the phone that's familiar with you, and we're going to be able to address the, 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 the matter at hand as soon as possible. So with that, my throat's starting to get a little bit sore, and I feel like I've been going on for a while. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the ball over to, uh, to 
uh, George here, and he's going to be able to walk you through what uh, Store Trends 2610 looks like. Yeah. Hey, guys. I um, hope you've enjoyed it so far, and hope I can uh, finish off here with a bang. So, uh, you should be able to see the the uh, UI screen here. Um, I've gone full screen, but I'm just in a web browser. I'm actually in Google Chrome. Um, you can use whatever web browser you want. You simply put in one of the IPs uh, that's configured on the unit. Uh, this will come up. We go ahead and we log in. And let's see if we can get into it here. So, uh, it'll come up here in a minute, and you'll see here in the very first page that comes up every time you log in. We try to give you the most pertinent information, but we try to do it in such a way that is simple to read, um, yet, uh, you know, it gives you something to actually look at and to understand. So, uh, you can see here in the top. Uh, portion of this, uh, we have our overall space utilization, um, and we present this in a way where you can see how well your DDVM compression is working. Um, so the data reduction ratio here, you can see I currently have a 4.3 to 1 ratio on this unit. Um, here, right below it, we have two sections, um, you know, the top and bottom. Uh, on the top section, uh, this is what I like to call the virtual space. Um, this is the space that your servers are actually utilizing currently. And this is also the space that you would need to physically have if you did not have DDP compression on the unit. So you can see here, I'm almost at two terabytes of used capacity here. Uh, but then we have this little correlation down to the bottom half. Uh, and with this, you can see I'm using about 500, uh, I'm sorry, 450 gigs. Um, that's what I'm using physically on the drives themselves. So you can see the space savings there uh, that come with DDP compression. Uh, to the left of, uh, of that, you can see here, physically, I have about 3 terabytes on this unit. Given my current dedupe rate, I should be able to obtain about 13 terabytes out of this unit. Um, obviously, this will be dynamic based on your dedupe rate, but you can kind of see, you know, how much you can, you're actually gaining and how much more you can put on the system based on that. And then to the right is just how much you have free, uh, both physically and how much is predicted free with dedupe compression. Um, here, then this, this next section here is uh, where we can see our events um, and our uh, smart information. So, really quickly on the events, um, here we can see you know anything critical, anything warning, uh, basically anything that actually needs your attention. Uh, we'll populate it here, uh, and so you know anything that's happened recently you can be made immediately aware of it, and you know start taking any steps um, to to rectifying whatever it might be. Um, as a little side note on that, as long as your email alerts are set properly, um, the uh, support team here will probably be made a, uh, a alert of that before you, you know anything's happening. But just so that, you know, just in case, uh, you can see what's going on within your system as well. Um, to the right of that, the smart information. Um, so we do track the smart info for all of our drives, whether they're SSDs or whether they're spending drives. Uh, for SSDs in particular, uh, we're just simply looking at the um, the endurance levels of, as, as to what we truly want to track. Uh, you know, we're still looking at non-medium errors, we're still looking at growing defects, things like that. Uh, but the big point for SSDs is that endurance level, um, kind of like what uh, Todd uh, talked about a little bit. Uh, you know, we're at, the more you write to the drive, the the quicker the endurance will go down. You know. Um, so once we actually uh, get to 20% of endurance remaining, uh, we'll actually go ahead and proactively uh, replace that drive. Um, we've noticed within our internal testing that it kind of goes down exponentially from there. And so we, we obviously want to be as preemptive as possible about that. So uh, the other thing that we're looking at is the temperature status. So we are keeping track of the temperature of the drives and the chassis overall. Uh, you know, it might be as simple as um, a failed fan or, you know, maybe something's going on with a drive in particular. Um, and so that's kind of where we're looking for temperature-wise there. But um, that's, um, that's real quickly on, on those two things. Uh, the next section um, is the section that I, I actually find the most valuable. Um, so it's the performance section. And so in this particular section that we're looking at, we're looking at it at uh, system-wise, so for the entire um, SAN. And so you can kind of see we break it down to latency, IOPS, and throughput. Uh, we further break it down uh, to reads and writes, um, but we also show you the instantaneous value as well as the last hourly value um, here on the, on the side. Uh, here in this chart, we actually show the last two hours worth of information. 
Uh, you can kind of hover over uh, any one of these points and see what was going on at a particular point in time. Um, you can see here, currently, um, I have right under a millisecond of latency. I'm averaging, you know, right around or right below a millisecond for both reads and writes. Uh, you can see what I've been pushing IOPS-wise. I'm averaging about 70,000 IOPS that I'm pushing. Um, you know, I'm averaging about uh, one uh, gigabyte per second of overall throughput. And you can see here I'm actually over a little bit over a gig right now currently. And you can kind of see, so this kind of helps you uh, see, you know, what we're pushing, uh, what we can push throughput and IOPS-wise, but more importantly, that we can keep our latency down when we are pushing such high uh, demands here. So. Uh, the last little section here is for I.O. distribution as well as the read-write ratio. Uh, read-write ratio is very simple, um, you know, and it's more informative more than anything, but it's good to know at the same time. Um, the I.O. size distribution, what we're looking for here is the size of the I.O.s coming in and going out of the system. Um, it, the smaller the block size is, the more random they're going to be in nature. And so we want to make sure that our I.O. potential is, is being met there uh, properly, whereas um, if the block sizes are more uh, are, are larger in nature, uh, we want to make sure that the bandwidth is adequate for those. Uh, and you know, uh, that really only comes into play if there are some sort of performance issues or anything like that. But that's kind of one of one little indicator that we can use there. Um, going back up to the top, we actually have a secondary tab up here for volume stats. So like I mentioned, uh, those stats were for the system overall. We can actually dig a little further and see uh, on a per volume basis. Uh, what's going on. So you can kind of see here, I have a quick little table of all my volumes uh, currently running on the system. Uh, we can see, you know, capacity information, we can see performance information, and, you know, those are just the raw numbers. Uh, some people are more visual, uh, kind of like me, uh, and so actually you can click around to the different volumes within the system here, uh, and you can see uh, these charts kind of repopulated here real quick. Um, and so you can see the same performance numbers, uh, just on a per volume basis rather than on a uh, system basis. So aside from that, n nothing new here. Um, so let me go ahead and move on. Uh, the next thing I like to show is the hardware health. Uh, and so the cool thing about this is one, we show you actually a physical representation of the unit. Um, and it'll come up here in just a second. And so you can kind of see anything hardware related on the unit um, and you know the quick status on, on those sorts of things. Uh, and of course, it's going to take me a little extra second here. Uh, but I'll go ahead and start talking about it and we'll start, <laughs> we'll be able to see it here in just a minute. So you'll see the uh, physical representation of the unit, uh, but then you'll also be able to see, um, for example, the CPU usage, memory usage, the network utilization, uh, but we'll also be able to see status on um, things like power supplies of the fans, the drives themselves, um, things like that. I think this actually froze, of course. Uh, gotta love a, li a live demo, right? Uh, so, let's go ahead and see if we can get it back. Uh, I might try opening it up again here, see if that works better, uh, just in case. All right, I'll open up this guy. Uh, so, I just went from the left to the right controller. Um, you can log in through either controller. Uh, this is actually kind of good. Um, and it'll bring up the exact same information if this guy lets me in. Okay. So. This might be a good time to, 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 to point out a couple of things. You know, one of the things we like to do, uh, you know, specifically during a sales cycle, um, you know, we are, you know, we do take a very hands-on approach when it comes to, you know, scoping out what a configuration looks like. Uh, what kind of needs you're going to need, you're going to have to have, as, as well as obviously what configuration is going to fit best for your environment. Um, obviously, utilizing stuff like the iData tool and whatnot is a, is a really good way for us to really dig in and not just take our word for what we say is going to go on, but or what you need. But we will actually have concrete, you know, numbers to to back up what we're saying and whatnot, so we can really plan for, uh, you know, a, a proper installation. So. Looks like we got the uh, screen back up, so I'll pass it back over to George. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Doc. Uh, yeah, it was being a little finicky, apparently. But anyway, here we go. So like I was saying, we can see um, CPU, memory utilization, network utilization. Uh, we'll show that to you on a per controller basis. Um, and you'll notice uh, one of my controllers is a lot more active than the other one. Uh, we are in an active passive configuration by default. 
Um, so that's that's kind of the reason there. But you'll see um, the CPU and the memory uh, utilization should hover around 50%. Uh, that's actually normal uh, because of the DDoS and the compression engines and all of that. So uh, here in the middle, like I was saying, you can see physical representation of the unit. Uh, you can hover over these different little flags here, see status on the motherboard, the fans, the CPUs, things like that. Um, for the drives themselves, you can hover over the individual drives, get some quick information on, on a particular drive. So for example, this one's, uh, you know, it's online, it's an, S it's an SSD, of course, and things like that. Uh, if, I, if I have over this one in particular, you'll see my disk time, this is actually a spare, so this is a spare for, for a particular rate set. Uh, and these two here in the middle, these are actually cache drives. So it kind of helps uh, show you how it's all broken down. Uh, but you also notice uh, these bars that keep coming up and down on the system, uh, on the individual drives. And so that shows you the actual I.O. load on the drives themselves. You can see my right tier drive, or my hot tier drives on the ends, uh, those are being heavily, heavily hit whereas the cold tier is, you know, being hit every now and then. And so that's obviously how it should be. And, and so, uh, but we can flip this guy around. Oh, nope, wrong button. And uh, you can see uh, the representation from the back. Um, so you can see, you know, the power supplies, the fans, the, the interfaces, you can hover over the interfaces, see what the IP is, what the speed is, what the status is, things like that. Um, this uh, little, uh, so you can see here, we have the 10Gs on the, on, on the board as well. Uh, you can see what we use for the heartbeat, what we use for the data, and things like that. So, um, going on, and so moving on here, um, what uh, what I've shown you so far is just uh, looking at the status of the system and you know how it's running and things like that. Uh, one of the other major points that you'll be doing uh, within the UI is actually you know creating things, and uh, most um, most importantly, your your actual volumes, your LUNs. Uh, so we have a wizard uh, that we try to do for those sorts of, um, you know, uh, operations. To make it as simple as possible, so we'll go in through here, uh, and it's really quite simple. Uh, give it a name, uh, I don't know, uh, give it a size, I'll do this one at 4 terabytes or so. Uh, and you'll see uh, everything is thin provision on our system, um, you know, uh, the DDP compression engine kind of uh, makes the exact renew provisioning obsolete there, um, because it would DD all the extra zeros. But we also have this tier residency, so high and low, right? So high means it gets into the hot tier, low means it doesn't, it can only be in the cold tier. Um, aside from that, though, everything gets automatically tiered. Uh, one little quick note, whenever you're migrating, we do recommend going to low, so that uh, we don't um, overload the, uh, the hot tier just with migration data. But uh, another quick option here is to allow multiple initiators uh, to concurrently log in. Uh, that's for a clustering environment so that all the nodes can log in at the same time. But go through those options, hit add to list, go through the exercise again. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, everyone. Looks like um, looks like for whatever reason the WebEx screen is a little bit behind uh, Georgia's screen. So I realize a lot of you might not be. Uh, Seeing the same screen, okay, it looks like we just caught up, so we're on the same uh, volume wizard configuration screen, but uh, yeah. sorry about that, folks. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, but anyway, so now you can actually see it, so, you know, you can see what I've just been talking about. But uh, you just go through this exercise again a couple times uh, for as many volumes as you want to, um, to, uh, to go through it. And once you create all your volumes, um, you simply hit finish, uh, and, you know, it'll start doing everything in the background there. Um, and so you'll notice here a pop-up will come up here in just a minute. Um, going over the performance profiles, again, the high and the low. Uh, but the rest of this is um, our uh, recommended timeout settings. Um, so whether you're connected to a hypervisor, a physical v, uh, server, a VM, whether it's Windows, whether it's Linux, what have you, we have the recommended timeout settings and how to set them. Um, you'll notice this pops up every time you create a volume, just as a quick reminder. Um, obviously, we'd give you a physical copy of it so you can refer to it at any point. But just as a quick little reminder there. So, uh, But now that the volume has been created, uh, I'll let my tree refresh here real quick. Um, and here's the test volume that I just created. Uh, and so for the volume itself, you can kind of see a few quick things real quick. Um, you know, how the space is being utilized. Uh, if you need to expand it, Simply, you know, expand your volume here real quick. Say I want to go up to six terabytes, uh, and you know, hit apply, and it'll it'll 
expand the volume out that way. Uh, one thing we don't do is, is shrinking just simply because of the dedupe tables and all of that. Um, but uh, once you um, expand it on here, do a quick refresh of your the initiator on your server, and you can do the expansion on that side as well. Um, here, the target information. Uh, what we're doing with, with that um, section there is we're showing you, hey, here's what you can use to actually connect to this guy. Um, so, for example, in a VMware environment, you can do a static or, or a dynamic discovery. Um, here's the IPs you need at a minimum um, to connect to the to the LUNs on the system. Uh, and here's the IQ my name so you know, hey, which volume I, am I actually uh, logging into. Um, but uh, so you can see here I have two IPs that I can utilize uh, to connect to this target, uh, to this particular volume. Um, and so, you know, just kind of quick information there. Uh, going down on the bottom of uh, section here uh, is the performance profile. So you can go back and forth between high and low um, on the fly. Um, so like I said, we recommend low during a migration period. Maybe your migration is done, come back in here, set it to high, uh, hit update profile, and things will start moving up into the uh, into the hot tier, uh, you know, based on the on the uh, promotion and demotion policies. Uh, another quick little thing on this section is we have snapshots. Uh, snapshots we can do up to six different levels. Uh, we can do them as frequently as every five minutes here, or as uh, a frequently as actually every every 12 months. Uh, basically, we can meet your needs anywhere in between those two um, uh, numbers there. Uh, we also, not only do we do them on a schedule, but we can keep a retention rate as well. Uh, we keep a minimum of three per level, um, and then you can have as many as you want, um, up to uh, 1,024 per volume, uh, as long as you have the space, obviously, for to keep all those snapshots to capacity. Excuse me. Uh, but you can, uh, furthermore, you can use these snapshots for uh, replication between our units. So. Um, Aside from that, uh, I know we had some difficulties, uh, and I, I apologize for that, but uh, if you would like to see it again, or if you would like to go more in-depth, obviously we can uh, jump on a call and we can go through a uh, in-depth uh, demo here, you know, ask a bunch of questions, go as deep as we need to um, for all of that. So. Perfect. Um, well, thanks so much, George. We've only got a couple of minutes left here, so we'll just get to a, a couple of quick questions, uh, some of which came across on the Q&A communicator. Um, but real quick, I uh, want to thank everyone for um, for uh, coming out and participating in the event today. It was certainly a pleasure presenting to you guys. So uh, with that, we'll just knock out a couple of quick questions here. Uh, George, I think this first one's for you. Um, Ariel asked, uh, how's the RAID work in, um, in the hot spare disk? So I guess can you just kind of expand upon the RAID set in the 2610 a little bit more and how that works in conjunction with any hot spares that might be in there? Yeah. So um, what the RAID sets that we um, have available for you know, really any of our SANS, uh, we support RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID 10, and then we can go further into 50 and 60 and things like that. Uh, but so based on, you know, your capacity needs, your performance needs, we can meet the requirements there. As far as the hot spares go, um, they are dedicated hot spares, so each rate set would need its own hot spare. Uh, we don't do the global. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just, you know, if, if, if a drive failed on a particular rate set, it would immediately start uh, rebuilding on that, on that spare. And then when the... Uh, old drive was replaced, uh, that new replacement drive would become the new spare for that rate set. So. Perfect. Um, and we had a couple come across on the registration forms as well. Um, this one's for either Todd or George, I guess whoever uh, is feeling froggy. Um, how does uh, VMware uh, perform in hybrid versus all flash environments? Is there any sort of differences that people need to be aware of uh, when using VMware on either of these two systems? Uh, no, so it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, a very simple overall process, uh, whether it's a hybrid or, or a um, all-flash array. Um, the overall presentation is, is uh, the same. Uh, like, you, you know, like I showed you here, we create our volumes. Um, after that, we just go into um, your vCenter, uh, use your um, SCSI the initiator to log in to the LUNs here, um, and they're going to be presented the same way no matter what SAN you're using. Uh, and then from there, you just simply create a data store off of that, and then, you know, spin off your VMs, your applications, what have you. So. Okay, awesome. And last one, um, then we'll let everyone go. Todd, this one will be for you. Um, how um, how price competitive uh, is All Flash compared to some of the other options like the hybrids that we that we talked about a little bit earlier? 
That's a great question. Uh, you know, obviously, we're we're going to go back to you know, it's going to depend a lot on what's going on with the um, you know the dedupe and compression numbers. Uh, you know, if we're in an environment where we're seeing a, a good positive dedupe and compression ratio, you know, you're going to we're going to be getting into a very comparable price per gig. Uh, uh, price point between the the, uh, the the hybrid and the all flash. Uh, generally speaking, you know, and obviously, you know, I'm speaking very generally here, but we can get down pushing the, you know, pushing into the uh, the 50 cents per gig, you know, for all flash. And again, you know, that's probably talking about just the hardware and whatnot. But it, you know, if we're seeing the, the proper dedupe and compression numbers, then you know, you are going to see some very very attractive pricing when it comes to the all flash array. Perfect. Uh, well, again, uh, we're at the top of the hour, so I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Thank you guys so much again for your attendance and participation in this event today. Hopefully we'll get to present to you again at a future virtual lunch and learn or something like that, or maybe uh, even a regional event that we might be doing close to one of your cities. If you have any questions for us after the event, please feel free to reach out anytime, uh, either through our website or through a direct email, and we'd be happy to help any way that we can. Um, but for myself, Todd, and George, uh, we thank you all so much for attending, and we look forward to presenting to you again in the future. Thank you very much.